We, we've had on each of the previous days a sort of a case history of uh, an effort to inform policies of one sort or another with science and indigenous knowledge, and we have another one coming up right now this morning that I think you'll find particularly current and fascinating. Um, and I want to introduce Jeff Green, who is the founder and president of the Students on Ice Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I urge you to uh, get familiar with them. Jeff is, I, th I think the best way to describe him is he's a force of nature. He does an amazing thing. He has educated a lot of people uh, about the poles, uh, young people, and he is, um, he's superb at it. And he'll come up and introduce this panel that's going to talk about uh, indigenous knowledge and science informing the these amazing marine conservation areas that the Canadian government has created in the Arctic. So it's all yours, Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Brendan. Um, great to kick off the final day of Arctic Futures 2050. I um, really want to thank the organizers of the conference for uh, inviting me, our two panelists today, and also the Students on Ice delegation um, to, to be here. And I also wanted to extend a special thank you to the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa, who helped to fund our delegation to be here this week. Brendan and I came up with an, a plan last night for him and I to leg wrestle to, uh, to, set this, to get things going this morning. But um, in the interest of keeping on schedule, I think we, we postpone that to later. And I didn't want Brendan to get injured. You know, we need him for the rest of the conference. Um, with this morning's panel, we are excited to focus on and share with all of you the story of a very recent and successful creation of Talarutyup Imanga, the largest and newest national marine conservation area in the Canadian Arctic, officially announced on August 1st, just a little over a month ago, as well as the announced interim protection for Tuvaiwitak, also known as the High Arctic Basin. These agreements and the process between the Inuit and the Canadian federal government to create them have really broken the mold and created a new model of collaboration, conservation, and policymaking for the future. I think you're going to see this morning how this real life example of, of the important, is, is a, this real life example of this, um, this story is, is a an example of the, the important goal of this conference and why we're all here. I have the easiest job of being a moderator ever because our two panelists, Sandra Inutik and Kevin McNamee, just lived this journey over the past two years, and they were both instrumental in its successful outcome. Sandra, as the chief negotiator for re representing Kikitani Inuit Association, and Kevin as the Director of Protected Areas of Parks Canada. So rather than sitting across the negotiation table as they have been for the past two years, um, this morning is a first really for them to sit down, reflect on this journey and share their thoughts with all of us this morning. So I'd like to invite Sandra and Kevin to come on up to the stage. Also, to set the stage for our panel, we'd like to begin by sh sharing this short video with all of you. When you look at our region, the Arctic, uh, most Southern Canadians kind of look at it as a very remote, barren, desolate area. However, what Canadians should know is that this area is full of life, full of people uh, that have lived here for thousands of years who rely on the abundance of wildlife. And if they uh, take a good look at this area, they will realize how rich we are in our natural uh, habitat and our environment.
That day in Pond Inlet in 2017 was a very special, momentous occasion for Students on Ice. And on that day, we were present, all of us together, when the Canadian government committed to Talaruptu of Imanga. Uh, not only was it the largest marine conservation area in Canada, but it was also the largest marine conservation area in the Arctic. So for us to be there for the announcement of that intention two years ago in 2017, and for us now, two years later, to be here in Arctic Bay um, for the official announcement is, is pretty special. The announcements we're making today about protecting this region are not just about today. They are about tomorrow and the next decade so it's a very significant day because of the mass and the area and the enormity of the uh, National Marine Conservation Area uh, that is going to be celebrated today, Talagotub Imanga. At a global level, uh, the importance of this, it's, it's phenomenal because in the context of the UN Biodiversity Convention, we have a global agreement and that is that 10% of the marine and coastal lands will be put under protection. And with Canada's commitment for, uh, for this protected area, Canada will way uh, overpass its target, reaching probably about 14%. It affects five communities. Once um, this process starts rolling, we're going to start seeing some benefits that will directly uh, impact the communities that are affected, especially Inuit. A lot of uh, questions have been uh, asked uh, by Inuit. You know, how is our water being used and what's happening around our uh, marine mammals? Uh, are they being affected by global warming? Are they being affected by uh, industry. The protected area is very important because we have heard and seen with our own eyes how climate change is affecting our marine animals and those marine animals that we rely on for sustenance. I don't know if you walked into the store, I'm pretty sure you saw some outrageous prices. So uh, with us, with our group, being able to harvest seals, that really helps out the local population in uh, getting healthy food. Everything that was eaten tonight was cut around these areas. There was walrus, narwhal, a seal, arctic char. It comes from the people. Each community, when they, when they do the visits, they voice their concerns and QI is able to collect all the information and request what is asked by the people. So it gives them the power to negotiate for what the people want. The indigenous-led conservation initiatives are very important because um, historically they've never really been done before. If you look at the history of the government, for example, they have basically uh, identified an area that they wanted to protect and then they just proceeded with that without really consultation with the people that are going to be impacted. The federal government, when they say we're going to do seismic testing here or there, you really have no one to turn to and it's really hard to figure out who to approach. But with this agreement, it gives me a bit more sigh of relief that it, these kinds of activities will not happen. So my grandchildren won't have to fight that kind of a fight. What QIA has done is that they've actually said, no, this is going to be Inuit-led uh, process where we are going to be at the forefront, involved right from the beginning to the end, and we're going to ensure that any agreement that comes out of this is going to directly benefit the people of the region and that is so significant in such a short amount of time how much has been accomplished and it's a great day for all. Canadians should be very proud that this is part of their country. I'm proud of it. I think a lot of people are proud of this. This is, uh, uh, this is probably the first, uh, it's going to be our model. You can create models where both the nature wins 
and the local community and the economy. I mean, the model we were describing here is generating jobs for the community. It's, it's building infrastructure that it's much needed. And with that, you empower the local community to in turn continue to, to be good stewards of the land. It's a bit of an emotional day for me because I'm a product of when the federal government had a huge imposition on Inuit. And I watched my parents having to let go of parenting as their children and having to send us to residential school um, away from them, away from the community, and that bond was severed. And to me, we are reclaiming who we are, reclaiming how we control research, how we control our communities, how we control our environment. And this day is so significant because I want the younger generation to have a better ownership than my parents and I did. Okay, so that's a, that's a glimpse at where we are as of a month ago. But Sandra, um, just, uh, <clears throat> I get a little teary actually, <laughs> and I see you are too. Um, tell us about your journey in helping, helping to get to where we are today. Um, yeah, it's difficult to watch because <laughs> I love all the people in that film too. And um, so I think it's important to go back to the days when um, in the 1960s, that's when uh, there started to be interest in mining oil um, and gas uh, extraction and permits were starting to be given by the federal government um, to, ex to explore potential. And uh, this is when Inuit um, started to realize that their lives were, were their li way of life was at jeopardy. And um, so this is when Inuit started to um, collectively s say that they want to protect their way of life. And um, so the wanting to protect this area um, started then. And, uh, and this uh, really propelled the land claim process. And um, so from the 70s to 1993 was when the land claim agreement was negotiated. And all this time, Inuit wanted to protect this, um, well, protect all of Nunavut, but particularly uh, places like this. And um, so the land claim set, uh, set up a framework where if any mining activities or parks or conservation areas are to be created, then Inuit, ha um, the federal government has to sign an impact, negotiate and sign an impact and benefit agreement. So this is, that's the process that we just used. Um, so the, when we first started um, at the negotiations table, uh, where our team started was, okay, how do we um, start from an Inuit perspective of uh, our relationship with our environment, um, the concepts of stewardship and reciprocity? When you're up against a system where exploration is the premises. Um, the Canadian or European uh, system is that uh, our lands are for exploiting and, um, and in order to conserve, uh, you limit activities and that's conservation. Whereas in our way of thinking, you start from conservation or stewardship. And how do we articulate these concepts to the system and so we um, worked with indigenous scholars to put some language around and how to communicate that and also what it means to have 
um, a conservation economy? What would it mean for us? Um, do we call it a hunting economy? Do we call it a conservation economy? And we chose conservation economy because that concept had been um, proposed by Mary Simon in a report to the federal government. And then we started to put together, um, okay, what would this look like if we were to start from the premises that Inuit are a hunting society and the, the conservation, uh, the product of conservation is abundance and our way, it will protect our way of life. So, um, so we wanted um, monitors, uh, um, we wanted full-time hunters, food processing units, um, small craft harbors for, the, for all the communities, uh, an office building for, for the monitors and the hunters that um, allow for hunting, hunting um, activities. We also put in um, research uh, article where you know, we get to identify uh, priorities uh, for research and are the drivers of research can participate and and um, also funding. Um, what the map that you see was uh, done by Kikirtani Inuit Association um, during the feasibility study. This is Inuit knowledge. Uh, on a map. Um, Kevin will speak a little bit about how the federal government originally came up with boundaries in 2010. And uh, it was a unilateral decision by the government of the day. And Inuit said, no, the, the boundary isn't sufficient. And it was 44,000 square kilometers. So Inuit then went to the communities and asked, okay, where are the calving grounds? What wildlife live where? What, where are the calving grounds, migration routes, habitats? And um, this is my favorite map in the whole wide world because it shows you um, uh, an image, Inuit knowledge. And that's how the boundary was created. Um, so I think I, I'll stop there for now. I wanted to just mention the, the role that people like PJ played. This is PJ, the president of Kikitani Inuit Association. Yeah. I'm so proud of the leadership, Inuit leadership, during this process because we really, um, this was something that the communities wanted. And, um, and the PJ is from uh, Greece Fjord, the highest uh, northern community, um, and I'm from one of the communities, too, in Cloud River. Um, so it, it's, very, it, it's very personal in some ways, because this is, this is our ancestral home. And um, so PJ was, um, he's a young leader, and he just um, shone, shined <laughs> um, through this process and worked with our, Nunavut, our regional and then our national. So it went from the community to our region, um, to Nunavut, to national. So it really showed Inuit leadership, um, the governance structures that we've, we've chosen. Um, it really showed it in practice how well it could work. Uh, under PJ's leadership, yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Kevin, you've been at the, the protected area thing for a long time, but this was different um, from what you've told me and what I've seen for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about this process from your perspective? Okay, well, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Sandra. Um, just one clarification. Um, I lived the first eight years of this process uh, when it came to negotiating the final agreement, I didn't have the pleasure to sit across the table from Sandra. We had Jenna Boone, who was our field unit superintendent involved, but uh, certainly lived the feasibility assessment process. And so that, that was, that's the part of the journey I want to share. Um, the map you see here is obviously a map of Canada with the national parks and national marine conservation areas. And the circles in green are active um, 
proposals, and you can see the successful one of Teleripta bimunga um, with the, uh, the blue area up around uh, Baffin Island. Um, it's important to point out that in our establishment process, we've been given um, direction by Parliament to involve affected coastal communities and Aboriginal organizations in the efforts to establish and maintain a system of national parks and marine conservation areas. It hasn't always been that way, um, but that, that is what uh, Parliament has, has deemed we need to do. And of course, it just makes sense to do that. So if I could go on to the second slide here. So in 2009, the governments of Canada, Nunavut, and the Kikitani Inuit Association signed a uh, memorandum of uh, understanding um, to collaborate to undertake an assessment to determine whether an NM, a National Marine Conservation Area or an NMCA is feasible under what conditions and, and what would be the boundary. So what this slide illustrates is what science, Western science, uh, the federal government had, gathered by Department of Fisheries and Oceans, gathered by academics. So this is really your, your Western science perspective. So you see an overlay and the, the red areas clearly indicate the areas that are of you know, the highest ecological value to the area. Um, and it does not include traditional knowledge in, in that map. So go on to the next one, please. So here what you see is in 2010, the federal government um, announced its proposal, put on the table its proposal for a 44,000 square kilometer boundary. Um, for Americans, that's the size of uh, Switzerland. So please, you got, got to get under the square kilometer, get under the metric system. <laughs> it's really difficult to convert all these things at seven in, in, in the morning. Um, so this was for the purpose of initiating discussions. And in drawing this boundary, use, we use the science you saw before. On the eastern end, you see a number of green blobs that represent hydrocarbon potential that had been identified. And then the grid area you see are 31 oil and gas leases held by Shell Canada. And again, for comparison, that blob there is the size of Denali uh, National Park. It, it uh, was not developed with Inuit or the government of none of it, nevertheless. This was an important step because we had a conservative government that clearly put on the table an area that they were prepared to see protected um, and not to allow oil and gas. So nevertheless, it, it was one that did not involve Inuit or the government. I'll go on to the next one. So in our steering committee, which uh, started to meet in 2010, this is essentially um, what we were looking at was the federal proposal. We had the shell uh, leases, and we had a, an existing national park. Again, it's important to note, under our legislation, Parliament also directed Parks Canada to, quote, consider traditional ecological knowledge in the planning and management of national marine conservation areas. So, up to this point, that hadn't been done. So go to the next slide, please. Um, and this slide is, is a slightly different than Sandra's in that what you see there in the sort of white line is the uh, 2010 boundary superimposed over, over the results of the traditional knowledge studies that were undertaken during the feasibility assessment. And you can quickly see that from a traditional knowledge perspective, we were missing a lot. So you can see in, you know, in particular in the red and the orange areas, areas identified by the Inuit and the five coastal communities in proximity to this proposal, what was not included. So go on to the next one. So at our steering committee uh, meetings, this is essentially what, was, uh, what we were looking at. So there was the federal proposal, there was the Kikateni Inuit Association proposal, and in between, you can sort of see, again, the size of Denali, the 31 oil and gas leases. So in proceeding to get to a, a final boundary, one thing we did not do 
was try to smush all of this together. Sorry, that's a technical term in Canada, maybe, but <laughs> we, didn't try to, we didn't try to say, okay, how do, how do we get all this data and information to, to fit into one matrix? Each one stood on its own. So it, it was to move forward like that. So in hindsight, I think what we went through was a process of looking at our obligations, our opportunities, and what's the outcome that we want. So under obligations, obviously the Nunavut Land Claim Agreement, a modern day treaty that really emphasizes the need to work with Inuit, uh, conservation of wildlife, use of wildlife, Inuit rights to continue to access that. Um, provisions of our act, which I mentioned, obviously the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and an overriding priority that our Prime Minister provided in 2015 to all of his ministers, the entire cabinet and the federal government, that reconciliation was the overriding priority of this government, reconciliation with Indigenous people. Um, so it, it's important to note that through our process, we did, there was a change of government um, in 2015, and so reconciliation really became a top priority. In terms of opportunities, the, the Prime Minister had also mandated uh, two ministers, including ours, to get to 5% protection by 2017 and 10% by 2020. And the larger proposal contributes, uh, at that time, would have contributed 1.9% to our 5% target of 2017. So it was the only game in town, if you will, in terms of a marine protected area that would add significantly. So that was to our advantage. Um, and it was a game changer, which we can go into maybe during the Q's and E's. The other thing is that from time to time, I would sit down with the Nature of Conservancy of Canada to review you know, what, what are we working on and where are the opportunities. So for the price of a Tim Hortons coffee, I suggested to the to the president at the time, they may want to talk to Shell to see what can be done about those oil and gas leases. Four months later on Ocean's Day 2016, Shell uh, joined with uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, our ministers and World Wildlife Fund Canada in announcing they were relinquishing those rights. There was no compensation, there was no quid pro quo, and frankly, I think sometimes they don't get the due that they should get for what they did, which was essentially they recognized the importance of the area to Inuit and how that could possibly stand in, in the way. So to sort of wrap up, I'm getting there. Um, outcome. So in our consultations with five Inuit communities, as the map demonstrated, but also the prevailing issue that all three partners in this study heard was that Inuit wanted the NMCA to protect marine ecosystems and resources. They were clear that this was key to protecting Inuit culture, to maintaining access to country foods that Inuit depend on, and is central to supporting their traditional lifestyle. There was also a strong fear of the potential impact of any kind of oil spill that may come from development. So in the end, Taking into account the symbiotic relationship between Inuit and the ecological components and systems of Lancaster Sound, and all of the above factors that, that I've mentioned, we got to the point, if you could move forward, please. We got to the point, as you saw in the video on August 14th, that we signed another memorandum of agreement confirming it was feasible, the final boundary, and that negotiations of the final Inuit impact agreement would take place which took two years. And in that video, the one thing you, when you saw our minister speaking, when the minister said to 400 community residents of Pond Inlet, <laughs> sorry, this one gets to me, when she said to the community of Pond Inlet that this area would be protected, you should have heard the roar of the community. Like, it, it, I can still hear it two years later, sorry. Bureaucrats aren't supposed to choke up. <laughs> but <laughs> it, and it really emphasized that it's, it's, you know, it's not data sets and it's not that. They help, they help but it, it really is about um, helping set and, 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 and set a path to a, a sustainable future. So 
Um, anyways, that, that was part of the journey that I was proud and, and honored to be a part of. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, another, another thing that the Prime Minister, there was a lot of political will behind this. In many ways, the stars aligned from, from the moment in 2017 of the in, announcement of intention to August 1st of this year. That's a two-year period. That's, you know, these types of things used to take 25 years in Canada. Um, another thing that the Prime Minister had stipulated was a whole-of-government approach. And I think this is the first time that's been applied to something like this. But it wasn't an easy journey. There were some bumps on the road, and uh, it was an emotional journey, for sure. It still is. Um, Sandra, yeah, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges, maybe, um, that, that were, you faced in the process. Um, so maybe to explain the whole of government a little bit more, um, one of the criticisms of Indigenous people in their relationship with uh, the national government has been that um, the departments are very siloed and then uh, you can only deal with them on a small mandate um, case at a time. So in Mary Simon's uh, report that I referred to earlier, she had suggested that when the federal government um, is working with Indigenous people that they need to take a whole of government approach, then we can work on broader mandates. Um, so we really tested that commitment <laughs> um, because the, um, even just the stewardship concept, uh, conservation economy, we were so focused on food sovereignty during this process and um, that that's what we're trying to achieve. And even with the whole, whole of government approach, um, the food sovereignty issue didn't fit neatly into any of the federal, federal government departments or even inter-government departments. Like, um, so we would knock on doors of different federal departments to see um, our food sovereignty. We, we did a lot of publishings to, 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 to use um, literature with federal government on, on our vision and why we want this direction. And we, so we published a food sovereignty piece that can be found on the Kikatani Inu Association website. Um, so it didn't, so we were kind of stumped in terms of how we were going to achieve like the full time hunters, the full time, um, the monitors were a little bit simpler because they were monitoring the, the conservation area, but they could also hunt. Um, but in the end, we achieved that, but it's still a bit of an anomaly in terms of there's Agriculture Canada, but we have no agriculture. There's Health Canada that provides food subsidy, but that's all they do. So the food sovereignty piece, um, I think, is still a bit of an anomaly within the government in terms of how they uh, work with Indigenous people. There was quite a bit of money attached to this uh, agreement as well to make it work. And, and that certainly you can't underestimate that. Uh, the initial commitment, I think, Kevin, you said was in a $3 million range, and then it, no, or it's not commitment, but the discussion. And then what did it end up being in total? So um, the Inuit Impact and Benefit Agreement that we signed um, provides for $50 million over seven years. So it's related to the more sort of um, somewhat traditional protected area programs, but a major element of it um, is a, um, an on-the-land program, an Inuit Guardian program. And so uh, during the negotiations, in fact, we had a pilot project that we were pleased to support. Um, in addition, um, outside of the Inuit Impact and Benefit Agreement, there's four other agreements that provide uh, a total of about $190 million dollars um, related to infrastructure development, um, uh, coastal security, um, uh, several harbors. And 
This is, for me, this is, uh, you know, the, the whole of government discussion is, is really interesting because um, when the Kikitani Inuit Association brought forward their, their proposal, um, Sanders, right, I mean, you know, even I can say from the inside, there are so many, and, and I think this point was illustrated by the, the speaker uh, from the first day that worked with the Obama, the Obama administration. So many different programs, but they're funded differently, their timelines are different, you have to apply. Um, like, it, it, it really was a challenge, and how the QIA got through that, I, I don't know. But um, in the end, though, we, talk, we, the world con conservation community, talk about the values of protected areas, and we talk about ecological system values, things like that, the importance to indigenous people. But what this, this proposal did is, I think, it forced us to invest in those things that are beyond the sort of, you know, what we've done in other Inuit impact and benefit agreements is we provide funding for, you know, enhanced capacity related to tourism and visitation, the traditional values associated with protected areas. This one focuses on food security. Food sovereignty, again, which you've heard, is central to, to Inuit culture. So it's going to be really interesting to see how other um, proposals emerge because our country is putting a lot of stock and effort into um, recognizing indigenous protected and conserved areas. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, and I mean, it also gives the, the co-management to the people that have lived there for thousands of years and know it better than anyone. And that, increasingly, these in, uh, indigenous protected areas or indigenous national marine conservation areas is how we're going to get beyond 10% to 20% to 30% by, by 2030 and hopefully beyond that. Just quickly, and we'll go to questions, the, the purple part up at the top, that's the area I mentioned in my opening remarks called Tuvayuktuk. So that's going to be the next thing to get tackled, hopefully soon. It's a massive area. You've also got, it's not on the map here, but Pikila Sorsoak, which is a, would be a co-managed um, marine protected area between Greenland and Canada, the first 100% Inuit-led MPA in, the, in history. So you start to see a massive part of that area, the last ice area, coming un under some kind of protected status. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, in 2017, we sailed this former Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker all the way around Canada's coastline in 150 days to celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation. This was the journey from Victoria to, Tor to uh, from Toronto to Victoria. In the process, at the time, less than 1%, give or take, of Canada's marine and coastal areas was under protected status. And now we're on track for about 14% um, by 2020. So we've, made a, we've come a long way, and that's, that's because of all of these partnerships and stakeholders working together. It's really inspiring and really, really exciting. I will, I'll add, too, that from the moment we left the tip of Newfoundland to the time we got to the tip of Vancouver Island, we were exclusively an indigenous community. That means 70%, give or take, of Canada's coastline is 100% in indigenous lands. And that, then when you think about that, <laughs> it really makes you think about the strategy going forward uh, on, on protected areas. It, it has to go the way that this model, this was the critical one, though, to get done to allow these future ones to, to, to happen. Um, question, how vulnerable might the protected areas be to a change in prime ministers? In case you haven't heard, we have a, an election coming up. Or are they robust uh, enough to withstand government changes? Okay, well, um, uh, so... And, and we're going to keep uh, these answers short and punchy because we're running out of time. Okay, short and punchy. Um, I mean, yeah, we could be... Fe we are heading into a federal election in, in a couple... It could be literally within days. The fact is that the Inuit Impact and Benefit Agreement is a legally binding agreement on the Federal Crown and on the Kikitani Inuit Association. So um, 
I don't think it's, it's, it's vulnerable. This is the path forward. That's great news. This is the Northwest Passage. You probably know that, the, the eastern entrance of the Northwest Passage. What's the, center, what's the current approach under this new um, regime to developing com- commercial interests in the area, given the conservation status? Commercial, such as what? I suppose fishing or any kind of uh, extractive in- industries, tourism, yeah. Um, so part of the process that the federal government requires is to have a management plan. And so we're, in, we're uh, I think Kevin would probably know more about that process because it's more um, a federal requirement. Um, so that would identify a lot of the allowable, um, like, the like the shipping issues, for example, on the the commercial side, one of the concerns that we heard from the communities early on was that it they didn't want uh, sustainable fisheries limited um, because they knew in that region are just starting to get into fisheries and um, and it's an economic opportunity that can be um, uh, that can benefit the communities. So in, in that sense, uh, it w- it, we have an article outlining uh, in the agreement that the fisheries, uh, there's actually, we're gonna work with Department of Fisheries to, um, to try and um, make it easier uh, for Inuit to, to develop that. that. Um, so it, it's very focused on the the economic development of, of Inuit um, in that region. I think, too, it's, it's one of the, you know, legally, um, oil and gas uh, extraction is, is, is prohibited. But I think during our feasibility assessment, we looked at, at some of the things that were coming and recognized that, look, change is coming. Change is coming to Lancaster Sound. Um, as a result of climate change, but also with tourism, transportation, things like that. And, and we concluded that the National Marine Conservation Area, a collaborative relationship between Canada and, and Inuit, was the best way to try and manage that change, to try and get a handle on it, uh, to prevent some of it, and to sort of redirect some of the other. Um, there's a question about uh, shipping routes and how they may be affected by this area's protected status. There's a lot more activity. I was up in this area this summer. Um, We're seeing ships of all kinds, commercial, private. Um, There are studies underway with groups like the Canadian Wildlife Service to monitor where seabird foraging takes place, Inuit input on where marine mammals, um, for, for instance, narwhal, uh, are going in, in the summer season. So that's all being taken into consideration to, to establish future shipping routes. Um, but this is all still a work in progress, and the agreement was just signed a month ago. So there's work to be done, but um, it, it's, it, it, this is an opportunity, I think, to do the right thing and learn from past mistakes. And, and I hope that, that we'll continue on that road. Um, thank you for all these great questions. We've got a time for, I think, a couple more. Um, Sandra, what's the plan moving forward to ensure that, that Inuit benefit from, really benefit from this through employment, food security, health care, et cetera? So I, I didn't state the number of jobs that we, that we created with the monitors and hunters. Um, so the two of the two of the communities, the northernmost ones, are s- one of the smallest communities. Greasefjord is the smallest, and Resolute is a small town as well. Um, and then Arctic Bay, Clyde River are kind of medium uh, town sized towns, and then uh, Pond Inlet is a larger town. But we're talking about 150 to 800 to. 2000. So these are the size of the, the, t- the towns. So the jobs, we created 38 jobs. Um, so that, for one of the communities, that raised 10% of the employment rate. And um, 
and these are meaningful jobs. And, um, and that's the part when we did the pilot project and uh, we did a pilot project to show that it can be done. Um, we did that in Arctic Bay. So when you saw Neri in the, the film, he, he was the, um, so he's the, the manager of that program. Um, it's really shown, we, we did a report on the, the one year anniversary. So that report also can be obtained on the QIA website, just the, the level of impact on the, the five jobs has had on the community and the kind of jobs that they are. We still have a minute left, and we'd love to answer some of these other questions at the coffee break or just grab Sandra, Kevin, or, or myself. Um, maybe final comments, lessons learned, final thoughts on, on all of this. Do you want to go first, Sandra? Yeah, it's been really interesting um, because it was so intense. It was so intense, the negotiations. This normally takes seven years and we did it in 18 months. So I haven't really had time to process it, but I haven't felt celebratory, honestly, because I feel like this system should already be in place in our communities. This economic system should already be in the communities, but um, I'll find it within me to celebrate the achievement eventually. But yeah, it, it's been an interesting kind of processing the whole, the whole thing. I, I mean, two things. One is uh, just the real importance uh, of traditional knowledge. But it's not. I hope people aren't walking out of here thinking it's just, it's just traditional knowledge. It's also the, the sort of traditional decision making and governance processes that underscore that. I mean, Kikatani Inuit Association had its way of making decisions. So it's not just gathering the data and then looking at it on on maps. It's also respecting the way in which um, decisions are made. The second thing is, uh, I, you know, some of the, the earlier questions um, from the first day about, you know, do you create new institutions to, to do things? And I think this project really demonstrates um, the importance of the, getting the direction from the top. When you get the direction from the top, that can really change things. You don't have to create all these institutions. You've got well-meaning people, dedicated people, professionals, and through those collaborative relationships and, and bringing forward uh, the views of Inuit to the top, uh, you know, to the prime minister and that, though that, that can, as you can see, um, can, can really produce results at the end. So let's not keep fooling around with institutions. It's where's the commitment if it's there, drive it. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, um, and it should have happened sooner, but um, we're really proud of, of what's happened, and I really want to thank uh, Kuyana Mik, Sandra, thank you so much. Kevin, I'll have a hand for our panelists, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>